Hello, and thank you for joining me today. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Anita Steberg. I'm the founder and CEO of the Steberg Law Firm, which is a law firm in San Jose, California, where we help people with tax probate, trust, and estate issues. We get a lot of calls regarding tax. Some of it's for uh, complex tax planning. Uh, sometimes it's for um, to discuss some tax strategies, but we also help people resolve their tax liabilities. And when there's a problem with the IRS, we come in and we represent the taxpayer. And one of those things that come up is an audit. So as you are preparing your tax return, this time of year, we, my office gets a lot of calls saying, what, what happens if I'm audited? Well, my friend told me that if I did this on my return, I may have a higher probability of getting, uh, getting an audit. And there's a lot of myths around that. And audits don't have to be scary. So today I'm gonna to talk about the life cycle of an audit. Now is a great time to talk about what does an audit look like? What does somebody mean when they say I'm, I'm under an audit? What happens if you disagree with the IRS? So today we're gonna to talk about the life cycle of an audit. So generally, you know that you're under an audit when you receive a notice from the IRS that says, congratulations taxpayer, um, I'm your auditor and we're gonna be looking at this tax return that you filed for this year. And please contact our office to make an appointment. That is the beginning of the audit. You, you know that you've been in an audit. Um, the response could be one of two ways. Generally, it's to call the office and either that auditor will come to your house or business, depending on if it's your house or business that is being audited or your, your personally or your business, um, or the auditor can say, um, I want you to mail all the documents in and I will take a look at it. So there's two different types of auditors. Um, once they wants the documents mailed in, the other one wants to come to your place of business or your home and or you go to their office and they sit there and go through your documents in front of you. Once the audit has completed, and this the process can take one appointment, it can take up to nine months to a year, depending on the complexity and depending on how many issues or items on your return that the IRS wants to open up. So once the audit is completed, the auditor sends you a notice of proposed assessment. Now you could do a couple of different things with that notice of proposed assessment. The auditor lays out why they, uh, the issues they have with your return, um, they generally will have authority on it, uh, citing to code sections or cases or revenue rulings where they say this treatment of this item was wrong or it needed to be included in income, you didn't include it, whatever the issues are. And there's a calculation page. And the calculation page says if you accept this audit, if you accept the findings of the auditor, um, you will sign off and this is how much you will owe, plus penalties and interest. What happens if you don't agree with that? Well, normally the, uh, the notice of the proposed assessments gives you about 30 days to respond to the auditor. Put in writing why you do not agree. What do you have an issue with? Or if you're citing to another revenue ruling or tax code or case, um, you can bring that up. Or if you have more substantiation that you didn't think that the auditor even looked at, you can submit those as well. With the notice of proposed assessment, the auditor um, will take a second look at it. In fact, you can even request, uh, you can request uh, to have a conference with the auditor's manager and to let them know your grievance, whether it's the way you were treated or whether it's uh, you disagree with their treatment, you can get the manager who you've never been in front of involved in the case. But let's just say that you still disagree. Well, the IRS will send you out another notice and it gives you appeal rights. And the appeal rights gives you the right to, uh, to appeal to another office within the IRS. So this is still happening within the IRS. Somebody who has not seen this case before, who's not looked at your documents, who's not involved with your audit, um, to get a second opinion on it, if you will. They can, that appeals officer can overrule the auditor and fine for, fine for the taxpayer. They can uh, say, no, we believe that the tax, that the auditor 
acted appropriately and we are going to support their findings. Um, in order to get this appeal right, in the letter that you receive from the IRS that gives you appeal rights, it will say exactly what you need to do. It needs to be in writing. It needs to be submitted to a, the address that they um, that the audit report states. You have to request it be transferred to appeals. Once the auditor or their manager receives that letter, they are going to bundle up your audit, if you will, bundle up your case. They're going to uh, forward it to appeals. Your case is going to go in a black hole generally for about three months, but it can be as long as six to eight months. It depends on how backed up the appeals office is, how backed up uh, your specific office that they would like to uh, assign it to is. And at some point, you're going to get a letter from an appeals officer that says, hey, I am your appeals officer. Contact me in 10 days or 14, 14 days if you would like a copy of the administrative file and let's set up a time that we can talk where you can present your case. And the, you can either do this telephonically or you can request that the hearing takes place in person, face to face. After the process has completed, you then go, you say, well, what happens if I still disagree? The, the appeals officer says, oh no, taxpayer, you're wrong. Um, I'm gonna side with the auditor. Is that it? Well, no, it's not it. So they're going to issue a statutory notice of deficiency. And upon that notice, it's it will have an audit report as well. And it will, on the front page, it says last date of file in tax court. And it says big note, big letters on it, notice of deficiency. And the taxpayer has a right to have a judge in the United States tax court look at the case and make a ruling on it. And that that judge, just like any other court, will have a hearing on it or a trial, if you will, where you can put up witnesses, you can have uh, evidence entered into uh, into the matter. And the judge will hear your, the taxpayer's case and the judge will hear the IRS's case. When the judge does that, he will adjudicate the matter. He will um, more than likely take the matter under submission. Um, he will set a briefing schedule and that judge will ultimately issue a ruling on your case. And that is binding on you and the IRS. Now, can you appeal that? Yeah, you can appeal it. Um, you can pay the taxes additionally and then put in a claim for refund if you still think the IRS is wrong. Um, so there's, there's a, lots of different ways if you do not agree with the auditor that the case can be moved forward. There's a lot of different options. If you don't agree with that auditor, even after you've gone through an audit, there is multiple levels of review. And ultimately, you can have a judge decide before you ever pay a cent on the tax deficiency. So when someone says, oh, I'm in appeals, I, I had an audit and I'm in appeals, or yeah, I just got an audit notice, knowing that is the beginning of a process. Sometimes, depending on the issues, depending on the auditor, depending on the timing that's involved, um, depending on how many years the tax uh, the auditor opens up, an audit, like I said, it can be very short. It could be one meeting with the auditor, everything looks fine, or they're only looking at one or two issues, it gets resolved at a meeting, and that's it. Other cases need to be appealed throughout the administrative process. And if the taxpayer doesn't want to go to appeals, they don't have to go to the appeals department or the, the appeals division. The taxpayer always has the right, once they get that notice of proposed assessment, that they can just uh, not respond or say this is disagreed. And the IRS, rather than going through the appeals process, because that's not what the taxpayer is asking, they can issue a statutory notice of deficiency. They can forward it onto that unit who issues those notices and the statutory notice of deficiency will then be sent to the taxpayer, once again, giving them their right to contest the taxes prior to paying it. Um, my light just went off. Prior, uh, they can, the taxpayer can contest the taxes prior to paying it in tax court and have a, have a judge adjudicate it after the judge hears all the evidence that the taxpayer wants to present. And of course, the IRS will have their um, chance at the trial to present their evidence as well. So I hope that helps. Hope you have a great day and thank you for joining me.